Hi, this is Manos Brilakis and Peter Taiti. Presenting case 8 for the manual of non CTO coronary interventions. This is a case of fracture of the angiosculpt balloon. The patient was an older man with a chronic kidney disease who presented with angina as well as congestive heart failure. He was found to have a proximal LAD and a distal RCA lesion on coronary angiogram. The RCA lesion was actually immediately distal to some previously placed stents in the mid right coronary. He was subsequently referred for PCI, which was initially done in the easier vessel, the LAD, successfully performed with a drug eluting stent. And then we attempted to PCI the right coronary artery. We were anticipating this to be challenging because of the tortuosity and severe calcification. That is why we used an 8 friends AL1 guide catheter that can provide very strong support for delivering equipment. We then advanced the balloon to the distal RCA, but unfortunately we found that the lesion was balloon undilatable with a persistent waste in the balloon. One way to deal with this is to use one or more body wires in an attempt to modify the lesion. So we did this, we advanced a Samurai RC next to the initial wire and then performed more high pressure balloon inflations. But unfortunately, despite going close to 30 atmospheres, we were unable to dilate the lesion. We then thought that if we delivered an angel sculpt balloon, we could possibly dilate that lesion. And uh, we did that by attempting to put what's called the distal anchoring technique. The distal anchoring is extremely useful in these complex cases of delivery through calcium and tortuosity, and can be done by advancing two wires through the coronary artery. One balloon is advanced over one of the wires. The balloon is inflated distally, pinning the other wire against the wall of the vessel. And this action provides good support for advancing balloons and stents over the second trapped or anchored guide wire. So we tried this in this particular case. We inflated a balloon inside the distal RCA lesion and tried to deliver a 3.5 millimeter angioscalp. However, we would not deliver it. And what is more, when we were trying to pull the angioscalp back, it was very, very hard. And we probably pulled a little too hard because the shaft of the balloon came out. However, the tip of the balloon was not there. So have a fracture of the angioscalp sculpt, uh, angio sculpt shaft, and this is how it looked like. And my initial impression was that this was actually the balloon material itself, that the balloon had ruptured halfway in and the balloon material came out. Of course, retrospectively, it's a little interesting. We didn't have the nitinol wires come here, which um, are part of the nitinol balloon. So what do we do now? We do have a balloon fragment and trapped inside the proximal right coronary artery. The good news in this case is that the patient continued to have undergrade flow in the right coronary. So we didn't have a, a chest discomfort, ST elevation, making us need to move in an emergency mode. But in some cases, this can happen. The key consideration in my mind when something like this happens, when material breaks into a coronary artery, is to understand how much material is actually inside the coronary artery. Is this the only portion of the fracture material or is there more material coming back? And that is critical to know because if this is all there is, one can put a stand next to it, deploy the stand and crush and essentially exclude this fragment from the circulation. And doing this instead of trying to retrieve this fragment can actually be faster, easier and much safer than trying to retrieve with snares or other ways. However, if there is much more material coming back, then we don't, we, don't do, we don't want to do that because then we'll have a lot of balloon material inside the aorta that could potentially cause thromboembolic complications. How can we find that out? Probably the easiest way is by doing intravascular ultrasound. Of course, various CINE angiograms could help as well, but the IVUS is the best way. And in this particular case, what we found is that the balloon was actually coming back inside the guide catheter. So the fractured segment was not as short as we thought, but there was some balloon material inside the guide catheter, which is actually good news because when we know that, we can now advance a balloon next to this fragment, inflate the balloon, and what that does is it can 
strap or anchor the balloon fragment inside the guide catheter and then we can remove everything and block. So we did this, we did advance a balloon, 3.0 millimeter balloon, inflated it inside the guide catheter, essentially anchoring whatever part of the fractured balloon was inside the guide catheter, and then very slowly try to remove it. And um, to our pleasant uh, surprise, the whole thing came back. So this is the entrapped angel skull balloon that is coming nicely back together with the guide catheter. As you can see here, the balloon that he's been trapping is actually protruding partially from the guide catheter, but we did have a significant portion of the balloon being inside the guide catheter. Unfortunately, when we came to the sheath, we could not pull back the um, balloon into the sheath because that uh, protruding part of the balloon was too large to come back. But fortunately, after we deflated uh, the balloon, we were then able to retrieve both the trapping balloon as well as the fragment of the angioscalp balloon back into the guide and then um, all the way out from the body. When we compared a new angioscalp balloon with the one that was fractured, we actually saw that the piece that came out was actually a very, very long piece. Although it was not supposed to be as long. This is matching the two balloon catheters and probably what happened and the reason why we have such a long length of the fractured balloon come out is that there was some uh, um, over expansion or discontinuity in the shaft of the anti-sculpt balloon. So the good news uh, were that um, at least the equipment was removed. We did some additional attempts to dilate uh, the lesion with high pressure balloon inflations. But then at that point, we had reached uh, 5.6 gray uh, and we'd be in the lab for more than three hours. The patient did have TM3 flow in the distal vessel. And although we could do things like laser with or without contrast, we decided to stop the procedure at this point for safety reasons to prevent any radiation skin injury and potentially bring the patient back for a repeat attempt in the future. So several lessons from this particular case. The first one is that severe calcification can cause problems. And one of those problems is equipment loss or entrapment. And just called balloon in this case, but stents can be lost, other equipment as well. This uh, can be prevented by very careful preparation of the vessel. In the Rotaxus trial, actually 2% of the balloon angioplasty arm did have stent loss. The other complication is that we can get the stent there, but cannot expand it. Therefore, it is critical to not put a stent in until after the balloon that is sized one-to-one -one with the vessel is fully expanded. For severe calcification, it is important to prepare the lesion. In a case like this, we would normally have done a thorectomy if it wasn't for instant stenosis. However, orbital is contraindicated in uh, instant stenosis to avoid uh, damaging the stent and getting it out of the body. And I also try to avoid it in a rotational thorectomy because I've had some cases of um, uh, stents coming out as well. Other options are the high pressure balloon inflations with and without body wires using an angioscalp or using the laser. Uh, we don't want to use laser with contrast if there is no stand in place, except for very, very rare circumstances. What to do if uh, equipment fractures, like a balloon in this case? The key consideration is to understand how much of this equipment is inside the vessel and how much is outside. One way to do this is to compare this with a new balloon or equipment that is lost. The other way is to use intravascular ultrasound to try to understand how much of the balloon fragment is inside and how much is outside the vessel. If the balloon fragment is uh, enough inside the vessel, then the simplest way to remove it is to advance a balloon next to this um, uh, piece of the equipment, inflate that balloon inside the guide catheter, essentially trapping the fractured part of the equipment against the wall of the guide catheter, and then slowly remove... Uh, everything unblock outside the body. Thank you very much.